Where is it that we can look to find Jesus? Of course, we can look in the pages of sacred scripture, in the record of the church's interaction with God, in the message passed down to us and preserved by faithful scribes and the church over the centuries to give us an accurate portrayal and picture of the life of Jesus, of his miracles, and not only that, but the context and significance of his coming into the world. So we can look in scripture, of course. We can look in the life of other believers to find Jesus. The biblical record is such to tell us that when we look at the life of other believers, when we interact with one another, our, our calling, our task is to be sharing Christ with one another. We can find him in antiquity. We can look back in the pages of historic accounts. Uh, we can learn that Jesus was indeed a historic figure. But where do we look? To find Jesus for daily life, for Christian living, where do we look to find Jesus to satisfy the deepest longings of our soul? Well, tomorrow we're going to celebrate communion. I happen to have put on my baptism shirt from uh, the recent baptisms that we did. And I'm thinking sacramentally for tomorrow. I really want us to focus on, uh, and we're going to emphasize, the celebration of communion. Because it's the beautiful sacred meal of the family of God when they gather together. Uh, listen to what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 17. For we, being many, are one bread and one body. For we are all partakers of that one bread. You know, tomorrow I hope that in the hustle and bustle of life, in the daily distraction, that we can push pause and we can gather together for the sacred meal of the family of faith. So that we might see, I mean, is, is Jesus present in the bread? You know, some traditions really focus on and emphasize the material, the matter, the substance of the elements of the communion. Is Jesus in the juice? Is that Jesus juice? You know, is Jesus present in the wine? Uh, some traditions really emphasize the nature and exacting manner of, of, of what's happening in those elements. You know, I think all of those kinds of theological conversations about what communion is are valid. They have a place. But if we're not careful, we'll miss the point. Because it's not about whether we use a certain exact kind of bread or, or a certain exact kind of drink. Because these things do come to us as, as symbols of something far greater. Now, however, let's not make the mistake of some in, in making the sacred meal only a symbol. As though it had very little significance. Because what it symbolizes is that Jesus is indeed present when the church gathers because the Holy Spirit is present because he lives inside of the church, not inside of a building. We have become the temple of the Holy Spirit. And when we gather for these sacred observances, you might say, these ordinances, these commands of Christ, these rites of the church, when we gather for the, for the Eucharist, as some would call the Lord's table or communion or the Lord's supper, and that comes from an ancient Greek word meaning thanksgiving. So we're gathering together as the family of faith to give thanks to God for what he has done for us in Jesus Christ. And they're in that sacred moment, you know, while ingesting the bread that nourishes the body, we symbolize the body of Christ, which was given for us so that we might be nourished unto eternal life. When we drink the wine, the juice representing the blood of Jesus, we recognize that he gave his life for us and that God is giving life to us. Listen to what uh, the early church father, St. Justin Martyr, said about gathering together for communion. When we drink the cup, which is mingled, and the bread, which was made, uh, we call this the Eucharist, Thanksgiving, communion, the Lord's table, the sacred meal. And no one else is permitted to partake of it except one who believes that the things which, are, which we teach are true and has received the washing, that is, the baptism for remission of sins. You know, what St. Justin Martyr is pointing us to is that while the meal is reserved for those who profess faith in Jesus, Jesus is given to the whole world 
any who will receive by faith and express that faith in Jesus. So in other words, sometimes someone might say, well, the communion table, uh, you know, ought it to be very, very exclusive. You know, you have to jump through a lot of hoops to get there. Oh, it's exclusive, but in the most radically grace-driven, inclusive way imaginable. Tomorrow we're going to gather and we're going to celebrate the Eucharist or the communion, the Lord's table with hearts of thanksgiving. Because the truth is that while we are not the only Christians, the simply Christian-only message is such that the sacred meal is for any who would receive it by faith in Jesus Christ. So tomorrow we cast a wide net for everyone on the journey of faith. And if they will but receive the most precious gift that God gave us in Jesus Christ, then they would be worthy participants at the communion meal, at the sacred meal where the family gathers because sonship and daughtership is not given in this kingdom based on who merits it, deserves it, or who was born with the best pedigree. No, no, tomorrow we gather together the family of God to share the sacred meal which gives life by faith in Jesus because of the radical oceanic-like depth of the grace of God which has been given to you and to me and all of those who would enter in by faith. Hey, God bless you today. I can't wait to worship with you tomorrow. Amen.